Hello everyone and welcome back to Biology with Mrs. Evans. Today we are starting our last video on evolution. So in the previous video, you heard me talk about how uh, the two bunny populations uh, basically evolved into two separate species. Uh, on the northern uh, bunny population, you had, remember, the short-eared bunnies were favored for. Sorry about that. And then the long-eared bunnies were favored in the southern population. So now we're going to look at basically the processes that help shape or help form new species and also the different types of natural selection. So there are different types of natural selection. There are three, stabilizing selection, directional selection, and disruptive selection. We're going to talk about each of those uh, coming up here in a second. So the first type is what we refer to as stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection is basically when nature selects against the two extremes in a population. So remember Darwin said is that there are variances that we see in a population. There are variations and nature is going to choose against uh, or choose those traits that are favored in a given environment. So let's say that we have a black brown and white variation in our bunny population. And let's say that nature, the environment has changed so that uh, pretty much it is brown uh, all year long. Let's say it's a kind of a sandy environment. And so what happens is, is that nature is now going to choose basically um, our brown bunnies because they're brown. They're going to blend in with this kind of sandy environment but because it's now a brown sandy environment the black bunny and the white bunny are going to stick out so they're going to be easy prey uh, because they're easily spotted uh, by say a fox whereas the brown bunny because it blends in with the sand is now able to survive so stabilizing selection is going to select against those two extremes so that eventually all you're going to have is the brown bunny all right, so notice this is the normal population. It has the normal uh, bell curve shape that you see, and that would include all of the variations that you would see in that population. But in stabilizing selection, nature is going to choose against or select against those two extremes. It's going to favor this middle trait, which would be, in this example, our brown bunny. The other type of selection natural selection is the directional selection so again remember the normal population uh would be or would have that normal bell curve that you saw previously that looked like that so in directional selection the one extreme trait is going to be favored basically over another so in this situation let's say we still have the same bunny population we have the black the not the black the black the brown and the white bunny population now uh, the environment has changed so that it is snowy all year round so now it is going to favor uh, the white bunny as opposed to the black bunny that's going to now stick stick out in the snowy environment as well as the brown bunny so you see a shift uh, basically in the trait that is the one extreme that is being uh, basically selected for uh, by nature. So what happens is notice that you see a reduction in these bunny populations. So it's going to select against the black as well as the brown. And you see more of the white bunnies uh, being present in the population. You can also represent it instead of drawing it like this you can see it like this. Notice here's the original population and notice the population has moved in the direction of the white bunny. So you see more white bunnies and a lower number of the other populations. So directional selection, nature is selecting against the other extreme as well as the middle trait. The third type of natural selection is disruptive selection. So this is when basically nature is going to favor the two extreme uh, traits are going to be favored over kind of the middle trait. Uh, the average trait is going to be eliminated. An example that I use for this is uh, deer population. So everybody's undoubtedly in the area that we live in has been traveling down a road and you've seen deer on the sides of the road um, those that 
as soon as they see you dart away are the ones that are going to survive because they have that natural instinct to get away from you. Uh, the other ones that freeze and do not move that are on the side of the road, they just stay there in a stationary position, those are also going to survive. The ones that have that middle trait that kind of run at first and then stop and then it's like, wait a minute, I got to go back and they're not quite sure what they're supposed to do. Those are the ones that are going to undoubtedly be hit by the car. Nature is going to choose against that. So you're going to see a reduction in that middle trait. So this is the original population, this dotted line, and that nature is choosing the two extreme over the middle trait. So the one that the deer population that it just automatically darts away, survives. The one that just freezes on the side of the road and doesn't move, going to survive. But the one that's kind of in between the two, doesn't know exactly what to do, is the one that's going to basically get hit. So you see a reduction in that particular uh, population trait. Speciation. Speciation is the process that basically creates new species, how they evolve uh, from basically a uh, common ancestor, if you will. So speciation, in order for that process to take place, there has to be some type of isolation where they are separated from basically one another. So how does this occur? You can have geographic isolation. So um, before basically uh, this part of the uh, South American continent to basically fuse together. There was this kind of gap, if you will, that these fish could uh, easily co-mingle with one another. But once this land bridge happened and it sealed off uh, basically the waterway so that now the fish could not co-mingle, now they're physically separated. So geographic isolation is the physical separation of a species. That can happen because of a mountain range, uh, a river that was created like in my bunny scenario, uh, an ocean, etc. Some type of physical barrier that keeps them separated. So now they cannot basically uh, mate with one another. So over time, you end up with two different species. The second way is from behavioral isolation. They have different mating behaviors. You will not see a cardinal and a blue jay uh, mate and that is because they have different mating rituals. So whether you not whether you know it or not, this is an actual bird. It's not a graphic image. That's exactly what this bird here on the right looks like. All right. So this bird is looking at that bird like, okay, you are a weirdo. Uh, I'm going to get away from you now. Whereas other species of that bird would say, oh, you're very pretty. All right. So different behaviors. Uh, keeps them isolated from one another. Again, you will not see a blue jay and a cardinal mating because they have different mate, uh, mating rituals that they uh, take place. And the other one is temporal isolation, which is basically they are isolated in time. So uh, if you notice, you have some spring crickets and you have some fall crickets. The spring crickets and the fall crickets are not going to mate because they're mating at different periods of time. And then if you notice the, um, the two frog populations that you see here, you have a leopard frog and you have a wood frog. All right, notice that the uh, wood frog, they prefer to mate basically in late March. And then the leopard frog prefers to mate in uh what is that mid-april or whatever so there's the chances of them uh breeding one another is going to be very small notice there is a small window of opportunity where they could uh, breed with one another but chances are they're not uh, because they mate at different times of the day or different times of the year etc so again spring cricket fall cricket they're not going to intermate so Divergent evolution. So divergent evolution is the idea that you have a common ancestor and over time the two uh, species evolved. So the polar bear and the grizzly bear, they have a common ancestor. So how was a polar bear created? A polar bear basically uh, happened because there was a mutation that occurred in the species that created uh, the white fur that you see in a, in a polar bear. So over time, 
uh, it developed into two species. So grizzly bears, uh, they looked at the white polar bear and uh, was like, okay, you're kind of weird and I'm not going to have anything to do with you. So the other polar bears that were white, they looked at each other and like, hey, we look like each other. And, and they formed their own small little group and they mated uh, with one another. And over time, we ended up with two uh, basically separate species, uh, species. They have homologous structures. If you look at how uh, their limbs are, they're the same. And we know it is because of a mutation that caused basically these two species. So divergent evolution, they come from a common ancestor and they branch out into these two uh, separate species. Adaptive radiation, you, t you heard me talk about this uh, before. Basically, they come from one common ancestor, but because they uh, occupy different niches in an environment, you see this variation in a population. So you heard me talk about this with uh, Darwin's finches. All right, so um, the finches that migrated from South America and ended up on the Galapagos Islands. They came from one common ancestor, but over time, those different uh, variations that you see in the finch population created these different species, and they survived um, in different areas of the island. This island had lots of nuts, and so the ones that were uh, that had the much broader beak uh, were able to eat the nuts and the seeds, and then this population survived over here because there was lots of trees and the insects that were in the trees uh, they were able to get because they had those very uh, thin probing beaks. So as over time, you ended up with this variation that you see uh, in the population, so the differences uh, in species. So adaptive radiation, how one organism or one uh, founding organism, if you will, develops into these variations that you see uh, over time. Analogous structures. So analogous structures um, are basically structures that are similar in their physical relationship. They don't have the same bone structure, if you will, but because they live in similar environments, they have similar physical features. For example, a dolphin is a mammal, all right? And it, if you look at its body structure, it has this very stream-like structure, but if you compare that to a shark, which is not a mammal, their features are similar because they live in a water environment. They both have to be able to swim. Same thing with the tuna. All right, They live in the water, and their physical features are similar because they are streamlined in order to uh, basically swim uh, in the ocean. A bat and a bird. All right, A bat is a mammal. And if you look at their wing structure, they are similar because they do similar things. They both fly. An insect, a uh, fly, their wing structure is going to be similar because they both do a similar thing. All right, so analogous structures uh, just indicate basically that they live in basically a similar uh, environment. Coevolution. Coevolution is basically when two species evolve in response to one another. For example, um, the monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies, uh, their primary food source is milkweed. Milkweed, if you've ever seen it, is a plant that if you break the um, stem, it has that milky substance. That milky substance is a poison to most other organisms. Um, that the milkweed developed over time to prevent other organisms from eating it. Uh, it is the primary food source for a monarch butterfly. So a monarch butterfly basically evolved the ability to uh, still eat the milkweed and not die as a result of the poison. So they developed a, a way to deal with that poison. So monarch butterflies evolved in response to uh, the milkweed's ability to create that poison. So when organisms... Uh, have a close relationship to one another, uh, we ha we see what's called co-evolution. Co one species is evolving or evolving in response to another. So uh, the flowers, they create pollen. So uh, a bee has the ability to collect that pollen and use that uh, pollen to make honey, etc. Uh, this is a um, newt. 
All right. So uh, rough skin newt has become more poisonous, uh, while the carmine garter snake has become more resistant to the newt's poison. So again, this gardener snake eats this newt. Um, as it becomes more poisonous, this snake becomes resistant to it because this is its primary food source. It makes sense. So coevolution, when one organism evolves basically in response to another. That's uh, the basics for evolution that you need to know. Again, we'll do a couple labs in class to look at each of these um, areas a little bit more uh, closely. I uh, hope you guys have a great day, and I'll see you in class. Bye.